Um, welcome to this um, early morning session. My name is Magdalena Skipper. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Nature, which is a, a weekly uh, science uh, journal. And uh, before I introduce my panel, um, I'll just very briefly set the scene uh, for what we're going to discuss here. So, of course, you will well know that uh, the focus of our discussion here is very beautifully framed um, with a, a really a, an invitation to consider what happens when humankind overrides uh, evolution. And it's an interesting thing to consider because, of course, when we think about it, we think about synthetic biology, we think about uh, new biotechnologies, but in itself, humans uh, modifying uh, evolution or trying to, to modify living organisms that um, are around us is, of course, not a new concept. Um, for a very long time in human history, we have engaged in trying to modify uh, organisms around us, of course, through classical breeding. You will be very familiar with examples from agriculture, be they plants that we consume today, our food crops, or of course, um, uh, animal stock, but of course, our very loved pets. They are all products of us trying to override and interfere with evolution in some way. But this is just the background in which to situate our discussion today. And so to discuss the, the much more um, rapid interference, if you like, with evolution. Um, uh, I have here today, um, I'm going to start from my right, uh, Kevin Esvelt, who is um, Assistant Professor at MIT um, Labs and Head of uh, Sculpting Evolution Group. Uh, next to him is uh, Werner Baumann, who is an economist by training and CEO of Bayer. And um, over on the far right is Beth Shapiro. She is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, Evolutionary Biology at University of California, Santa Cruz. So thank you very much uh, for joining in this discussion. And I'm going to start with a general, general question to all of you, actually. Why is it that we need to or we want to override uh, evolution or engineer living organisms? I think, um, as you said, this is not something that's new to humans. Um, I mean, the earliest records of us trying to change the way that species, the trajectory of different species evolution from the archaeological record date back some possibly 30,000 years with the first evidence of domesticated gray wolves or dogs in the fossil record. And since then, I think much of our motivation has been to come up with more efficient ways of turning carbon and nitrogen into more people, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the better we get at using what limited resources we have to produce enough food to keep us fed, the bigger our population is growing and the more we need to come up with newer, more efficient ways of of going through this same process. And uh, this has brought us to this stage now where we're using biotechnology, which really is a step change, I think. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not the same thing as we've been doing. It's, it's not the same thing as classical breeding. And I think it's a bit disingenuous to say that it is. But that's, uh, uh, yes, uh, to meet our needs, our growing needs as a growing population. That's right. And so, of course, this is, this is one particular avenue where we've been um, overriding evolution. There are other aspects of it. Would either one of you like to comment uh, on this further? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, ca I can only uh, uh, second what, uh, what Beth uh, has been saying. Uh, what, what we are doing is we are looking at you know, solving problems uh, in order to actually benefit uh, consumers and patients alike. And uh, what we are trying to do is, of course, to do it in the most efficient way possible and then also to use new technologies in order to uh, you know, solve problems that uh, were not solvable before or where problem solving took an awfully long period of time. If you look at traditional breeding on one side and then using, uh, let's say, biotechnology uh, to go and do precision breeding where we look at uh, very, very specific uh, expressions of a certain uh, property of a plant uh, that we can then uh, precisely uh, enact or, uh, or actually deactivate. Yeah, and that's what, uh, what we are in for business, but that's also you know, what, uh, what the company is all about and many of our uh, uh, peers are about. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Solving problems uh, to actually serve uh, the community and the people better. Yes. And that is what this is about. It's about attempting to build a better world. You say, why, d why defy evolution for the same reason we defy gravity? <laughs> Should humanity fly? Well, evolution is similarly an emergent law of nature. That is, 
when you have replicating information with variation, you get evolution. It's inevitable. That's how it works. But it being an emergent law, it's amoral. If we expect the world to be a better place in line with our highest ideals and the journey that we have been bequeathed by our ancestors, not just turning matter into more people, but to making people's lives better and possibly making animals' lives better. That's an end to which we haven't always turned our skills with selective breeding, is engineering animals to exhibit improved well-being insofar as we can tell. Is that something we should do? And in the past, we've been limited to our domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. But now, by looking to new technologies and learning tricks from nature, we think that we might be able to alter wild organisms too. Is that something that we should do for ourselves or for them? So this is very interesting. that you, you, You've jumped in right at the very sort of thick end of, of the debate here, um, thinking about evolution being agnostic of morality, right? What we're talking about here is designing. So if you think about design being in some, in some level opposed to evolution. I'm going to park this for a second because I'd like to come back to it. But let's take a step back and think a little bit more. Um, so let's set the scene for the kinds of things that we're talking about and the kinds of tools that we have to play with, essentially, today. So in the examples that we've just used here, um, we mainly stuck to agriculture, which touches on aspects of health, for example, through nutrition. Um, but there are other aspects that we can talk about, let's say specifically associated with human health and disease, spread of infectious agents. Would anyone like to comment, maybe give an example of, of what kinds of things we, we could um, do today or certainly um, uh, advance further uh, in the future? I think your work touches most closely on this, Kevin. But. <coughs> I suppose, although <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll try and I'll try you can take that. <laughs> well, evolution, of course, applies to pathogens as well, and so many of you may have probably heard of the crisis of antimicrobial resistance. Now, this is one that we probably can solve. Most of our antibiotics we discovered in nature. They're, they're the tools with which microbes wage war against each other, and we've merely adopted that same strategy. And that's one where we do need to change incentives in order to reward companies for pursuing new antibiotics. But we also need to think about how we leverage our new discoveries to prevent those pathogens from acquiring resistance. And this also applies to viruses. So with respect to infectious disease, bacteria are frightening, but ultimately we do have reserve antibiotics against most of them. It's the viruses that we really struggle with. And there's a lot of exciting new therapies for viruses that could help prevent pandemics, and that's what I'm particularly excited about, that we might be able to avoid not just the repeat of 1918 influenza, but of the far worse pandemics of the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are uh, you know, other diseases. Many, many of you know uh, that uh, you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of diseases are you know, just driven by uh, single gene defects, you know, monogenetically caused diseases yeah, such as cystic fibrosis, such as hemophilia. And uh, you know, the question is, uh, or, you know, we asked ourselves a question a few years ago, um, what would be the holy grail you know, for us as, as a pharmaceutical entity uh, in best serving our patients? And of course, it's not the next best therapy for a chronic disease. Uh, you know, the holy grail is to move from a chronic condition to cure. And then the question is, are there new technologies out there that would allow doing that? Uh, could we eventually cure people who are not curable, curable today because they were born with a genetic defect that cannot be corrected? Today, we have that possibility. But I think this brings up Kevin's point about incentives. I mean, what incentive does a, a large pharmaceutical company have to cure someone? Uh, this loses their income stream. Well, I, don't, <laughs> I would not necessarily agree with that. <laughs> I think the bigger question behind it is uh, what is the right system to uh, uh, incentivize right. mm -hmm. uh, research and development and pushing the boundaries yeah, for the greater good of right. human mankind? And then how do we sustain a system that uh, is actually uh, dependent on sourcing mm -hmm. yeah, that goes into research and development? Without the funding, we cannot move anything forward. 
Yeah, and we are of course a for-profit entity, but beyond profit, there's something that I would call purpose. And uh, uh, companies and organizations thrive uh, when they know what they exist for. Right. And we don't exist, as many of our peer companies, we don't exist primarily in order to make profit. We, we exist because we help solve problems that uh, we can solve with your, the expertise and, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, and the means that we have at hand doing that. Mm. Yeah. So I, I do not necessarily think that uh, it's a fair uh, representation to say, well, you know, once you can cure a uh, chronic disease which kills a, an income stream that spans the life of a patient, uh, you, you would actually prevent you know, doing that. Actually, the contrary is true. The question then is, what is the appropriate compensation for that? That is a much bigger question. Right. I agree with you. So, so very interestingly, our uh, consideration of overriding evolution in the context of health um, has now moved from, you know, I mentioned nutrition, so that was a sort of link with the first topic we, t we touched on. Then we talked about uh, infectious agents themselves. What we haven't touched on yet, for example, are vectors of disease, such mm -hmm. as, for example, mosquitoes and, and other tend to be insect vectors that, that carry these um, uh, pathogenic agents. But we moved through um, your contribution here to... Um, overriding our own evolution, engineering ourselves. When we're talking about uh, chronic diseases, you mentioned um, um, monogenic or sometimes mistakenly called genetically simple um, uh, <laughs> diseases, um, where you can modify uh, cells in a, in a body. Uh, but of course, I think most of us are aware of uh, events that unfolded just over a year ago now, um, when the, the general press and there was much discussion about uh, germline engineering of uh, the next generation. So let's touch on this a little bit. We, you know, you, with your first comments, uh, Kevin, you talked about, uh, you sort of wove in morality into this conversation. Let's talk about engineering ourselves and then we'll come out again to talk about engineering us and other organisms in a population context because that's, I think, quite an important aspect. Who'd like to pick up that particular thorny issue? <laughs> uh, nobody, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> with the notable caveat that my laboratory does not work directly with anything in humans, but I did play a minor role in developing a tool you may have heard of called CRISPR. <laughs> so CRISPR is again one of those gifts from nature on a silver platter. It's a it's a molecular scalpel that we can program to cut and therefore edit virtually any piece of DNA in any organism. And so theoretically with CRISPR, we could go into the genome of say an embryo and edit it. And this is what was done in, in China a couple of years ago. So not theoretically. Not theoretically. <laughs> but what is interesting of course is that most of these diseases that are cystic fibrosis and the like are single gene. And they can be prevented using current technologies that don't require going in and editing. In fact, there's comparatively few genetic disorders that require us to go in and edit. And it's also usually unwise for technical reasons to edit an embryo. And that's why it was premature. Not only was it, I personally think it was unethical to do it in secret, and there were questions about whether it was misleading to the parents, whether there was truly informed consent, but certainly it was a black mark on the entire field of science that it was done in this secretive way without public consent. Now that goes both ways because does anyone here know someone who was born through in vitro fertilization, IVF? Yeah, I agree. When IVF was first rolled out, about 90% of the public opposed it. So we do need to be careful because public attitudes do change. On the other hand, there's a difference between saying, no, we won't do it because a lot of people disagree, and being totally open about why we think it's a good idea, listening respectfully to people's reasons to do otherwise, and then concluding that this is really the business of, say, in this case, the parents. Yeah. So I think one of the most promising aspects to come out of that unfortunate episode, which really did decrease trust in science, is that the World Health Organization has announced that they will host a registry for human gene therapy. That all clinical trials involving any kind of gene therapy in a human should be registered, and therefore people will know what's going on. And that allows everyone to have a voice. Not necessarily a vote, but at least a voice. 
Yeah. And of course, it, it enha um, uh, ensures transparency yeah. of, of the process. I mean, there, there's a few things that uh, come to my mind uh, on that topic. First of all, the question, is there, does intrinsically good and bad technology exist? Yeah? Can you really qualify the properties of technology? Uh, and I believe that that's not the case very much, the question on how you put it to use. You can put it to use for, I think, very, very noble causes, or you can do the opposite thereof. And what we need is, you know, we need um, actually both in academia uh, and also in business, we need proper guardrails, yeah, and uh, you call that regulation. And the issue we have is that, uh, and that's where I think uh, you know, academia and business are joined at the hip, that there is less and less trust in society for the advances of technology, which makes our lives miserable. And the only way uh, to kind of you know, get beyond it is that we do a better job in terms of explaining what we are doing, what it is that uh, we would do, where the red lines are, where uh, we actively solicit uh, regulators and actually broader societal discussion yeah, in terms of uh, what it is we should and should not do. And uh, as Magdalena said, one of the key elements in it is uh, that we create absolute and ultimate transparency. Mm. Yeah? And, and only then uh, will we be able to manage uh, your new technologies uh, for, let's say, your better solutions in whatever area those solutions lay? So it's interesting what, what you said also about creating a dialogue with the wider society. One of my favorites, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally trained as a geneticist, um, one of my favorite examples of where an argument has been lost as a result of lack of transparency but lack of dialogue and engagement with, with the broader society is um, GMO, genetically modified organisms. Uh, this of course is not a new story, it has been with us for a very long time, but I think at the time when it was unfolding, there was, um, the, the discussion was left to those who are not necessarily very well informed about the subject area, and Beth has something to contribute <laughs> here. You know, I, I, I think there's a lot of confusion around genetically engineered or genetically yes. modified organisms, and, and part of the problem is this lack of consistent regulation for different types of genetically modified mm -hmm. organisms. Um, there's lack of consistency within countries. In the, in the US, there are three different agencies that regulate genetically modified organisms, and some of them have decided not to regulate organisms that could be produced naturally. That includes the USDA's decision for agriculture, whereas the FDA has decided that any genetically engineered animal is going to be regulated as a, as a drug, a new animal drug, mm -hmm. which has made especially in the academic, academic world where there's not that much money to go through these massive trials that you might need, made it very difficult to make progress. Um, there's a fantastic program at UC Davis where they've created ca cattle that are pulled, dairy cattle that don't grow mm -hmm. horns. It's an animal rights, it's a single change and it is one that could have evolved in nature. They've yes. moved an yeah. allele from, from beef cattle into dairy cattle and yet these animals now will be regulated as new animal drugs and they won't be able to enter the food chain despite this experiment and it seems to be grinding to a halt which I think is a real shame. Um, part of this is that the, the, the loud voices, the loud anti-GM voices drown out mm -hmm. the science and make it very difficult to communicate that the technologies that they opposed in the very beginning are not the same technologies that are being used now. There's no nuance to that dialogue and until exactly. we can have that nuance and different, re consistent international regulation that capitalizes on that nuance, mm -hmm. I see that it's going to be very difficult to move forward. With you are, you are, maybe if I, add to, if I can add to it, uh, you have uh, uh, hit on a particularly bad and sad example. Mm -hmm. uh, GMO, uh, I think if we look at ag, it's mostly about your know, transgenic technologies, mm -hmm. yeah, where you take your know, elements uh, you know, of one organism yeah, and integrate it into another organism. And uh, how that opposition came about is uh, a, a fairly interesting story, and there's an NGO behind it. Yeah, it was Greenpeace at the yes. time. They are Greenpeace for campaigning, you know, for campaigning purposes, looked at what it is that virtually affects everybody and where you can, you know, excuse my German, scare the shit out of people. And this was about food. Mm -hmm. 
and food security. Mm -hmm. That's how they actually started to campaign again GMO technologies. And what they did was they put millions of kids into misery yeah, because one of the things that had been developed is something that is called golden rice that carries vitamin A that helps people that uh, are uh, suffering from malnutrition uh, to avoid uh, you know, developing blindness. That's how insane the dominance yeah, of some non-government organizations are if they are campaigning for the wrong reason and certainly far away from science. So history always serves us um, interesting examples. The trouble is that we humans are not very good at learning from history and this, is, this observation is not just limited to our conversation. But I think your, your example of, of hornless cattle is, is, is really um, a great example of something I wanted to, to discuss briefly here next, and that is, indeed, as you say, that particular variant which is being engineered in, into cattle, and I have to say, I had the misfortune of seeing a video of what dehorning cattle involves, and I will never forget that video until the day I die. <laughs> Uh, so this is a naturally occurring variant uh, in the genome of wild cattle, which is now could theoretically be bred into cattle mm -hmm. using um, uh, sort of classical breeding uh, techniques. Of course, there are much faster ways, which is what you were talking about. Today we have technology which allows us to make such precision engineering mm -hmm. that actually the, the um, organism, which is the outcome of that process, is indistinguishable genetically and genomically from a naturally existing variant. Can you comment on this from the perspective of regulation and tracing of these designed organisms which have actually been designed to recapitulate what has evolved in some setting? This is exactly what I was, I was uh, speaking of earlier. The, in the US, the USDA has decided that they would not regulate yeah. organisms that are naturally occurring in this way, where you could have created that organism by breeding. And with the example of the, the cattle, you could do this, but it would take 20 plus generations to rebreed all of the beneficial traits of being a dairy cow back into that cattle lineage if you <coughs> use traditional breeding and cross them with beef cattle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear why the FDA has gone a different route and decided not to deregulate. This, these are not transgenic organisms in any way, and this is really what most people are yeah. most concerned about. It's actually essentially it's, it's identical to nature. Yeah? So you can't tell the difference. And uh, we have seen different regulators in different places go different avenues. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, one is, uh, of course, the question on uh, you know, have we really understood uh, all the risks? Yeah, that's certainly an issue in Europe. Yeah, we are uh, even in the X space. Um, uh, you know, gene editing technologies that work inside of the genome are not regulated. Yeah, as identical to nature, uh, but they are you know regulated under you know, the the GMO regulation. Right. The other thing in in, in that context is that uh, if you look at current practice, the question is: Is current practice better? Mm -hmm. You know how, uh, or maybe you don't, uh, how uh, we get uh, your know, mut mutagenesis going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you use heavy radiation or heavy chemical exposure, yeah, in order to actually get variation, yeah, and then you 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 take it from there, uh, and then the question is: Isn't Precision breeding, yeah, if you want to call it that way, yeah, yeah, or precision modification that could occur naturally, isn't that the much better and much targeted way to go? Yeah, I think one of the great ironies, you know, the popularity of the non-GMO labels yeah. Yeah. that you see at the grocery store when you wander around, they go, they're on everything. They're on salt, for goodness sake, yeah. which is, it doesn't even have DNA, <laughs> so how could it be modified? Um, but, uh, but you see it on the bottle of ruby red grapefruit juice, which is an example of a, of a citrus fruit that was created by this radiation breeding. Yeah. Just zap it with as much radiation as you could think of. Thousands of new mutations emerge, and yet these are not considered to be genetically modified or genetically your, engineered. Your salt comment reminds me of um, a label which I saw on a packet of sugar, which said, this is a fat-free food, <laughs> which is exactly analogous to what you just described. Kevin. Well, the thing about the thing about this is that it's punishing us for knowing what we're doing. And this really speaks to something deep in the human condition that I think is unusually, unduly perhaps, although that's arguable, suspicious of applying technology to living things. That is, people are more comfortable with this notion that 
at random. We're gonna, most people don't know we bombard our crops with radiation and chemicals in order to mutate them, create thousands of mutations who, sure. that we don't characterize, that don't get regulated in anything other than the most cursory way for safety. That's okay. But going in and doing something where we know exactly what the change is and we're not making any other changes, that's not okay. That requires extra regulation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense, but that's part of the legacy of mistrust. So if we want to do differently, we need to change our incentives. And I think that's why I'm gonna push a little bit on you, Magdalena, yeah. even though you're a moderator. In academia, publishing in high-profile journals, such as Nature being the premier journal, is everything. And if you tell us that we can only publish in Nature if we pre-register our experiments, if we say, here is what we're going to do, and we need to find a community that is interested in the result of this new technology, and we can only publish if we do that, let me tell you, we will. We Excellent. all will. And if we want to be moral, if we want to see improved consideration of morality in technology development, when technology is going to determine the future of our civilization, people respond to incentives. If you want to behave morally, put yourself in a situation in which you have incentives to do so. Very interesting. So I, I've made a, a note of this. I, I find your suggestion very interesting. So we've had um, a suggestion of uh, greater transparency, um, increased dialogue with many different stakeholders, um, a take-home message from me on nature to um, push for more pre-registration of studies, which I completely agree with. Before I let you go, however, since you started the trend of um, putting forward suggestions of what should be done, I'm going to ask you both as well, what would you like to see, let's say, in the next three years uh, change in terms of be it regu um, uh, regulation, legislation, um, um, technology, application? I know one thing you, Beth, work on a lot is aspects of conservation, which we haven't touched on here. Um, would that be perhaps one of the things you... You know, the, the reason that I like thinking about biotechnology and genetic engineering for conservation is I think that people fear it less than they do biotechnology for their food, what they're eating. Mm -hmm. And I think we have potential. There's a possibility that we can make some progress to be able to communicate the nuances of these new technologies to the public more effectively through conservation. Um, and maybe that will feed back then into the agricultural realm and we can, we can make progress there. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, the public want new ideas and they want new things, but they also want to feel safe, obviously. Yes. And if we can find a way of being effective in showing people that these technologies are not dangerous, we're not creating monsters, mm -hmm. most of us. Kevin, possibly. So, so, <laughs> so you're getting, yeah. You think through communication, would, would that be your through, your through communication and transparency? Yes. Yeah. And that's what, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but isn't that hard because we know that simply explaining to people what we're doing isn't enough. If you want people to trust it, you need to get them to trust something else. They need, they need to trust either us, and that trust has to be earned, yes. and transparency is one way. But I think you can also get can, them to trust the process, right? Yes, but you do that by being effective communicators and storytellers and scientists that, that people learn to respect and then they'll, or hope, you hope that they can eventually <laughs> I guess, respect uh, you as uh, a yeah, scientist. I guess you can take it even one step further and that is uh, when it comes to regulation, which for a lot of us, if not the majority of us, is really a black box. Yes that you know, we open up our regulatory processes yeah, when it comes to the registration yeah, uh, of new agents mm -hmm. and make it a real participative process where we invite people in and say, hey, we don't have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we do not only represent it to you, we invite you in. So be part of the journey, form your own opinion. Find people that help you form your own opinion right. because that is, I think, the only way. Yeah, transparency is good. Making it a participative process is better mm -hmm. yeah, because you create ownership with you know, the, uh, you know, the people that are ultimately benefiting from the things that we are doing. And in that token, the last thing I would ask for is that we get back to having more courageous politicians because many, many times they know better but they don't stand by the stuff that they know, in particular in the regulatory area. Yeah. I've seen it happen in Europe where I have conversations where you know, actually you know, uh, members of government tell me, we know that that technology is good, 
but you cannot expect me to say it because uh, you know, that is actually bad for my next election. Mm -hmm. And they go against their own regulators. Yeah? So what I would really ask for is yeah, to actually have some more brave and courageous politicians out there that stand for the right thing. This is the, exactly the right uh, place to be calling for politicians to stand up and be braver. Um, but it's, I think it's clear that the technology, we have a lot of confidence in technology. It really is very mature. We do know what we're doing. Um, we can look to the future in which uh, we will be increasingly um, modifying uh, organisms, including ourselves, um, around us for a number of different purposes. But we do need to engage um, a much greater uh, number of stakeholders, um, including the general public, politicians, regulators, uh, as well as, of course, scientists and technologists themselves. Thank you very much, Beth, Verna, and Kevin. Um, thank you all. And um, I'm sure the panelists will be here for a few minutes for your questions, if you have any remaining. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks.